good afternoon. This is our Book of the Month Bible Study. That's what we call it. But uh, B-O-M-B-S, Book of the Month Bible Study, BOMBS. That's our nickname for it, and that's what we go with. And who's this, and who are we, and who are who's calling us, and who am I, right? Simple stuff. And it's, But if you're new, you want to know. Uh, this is Christ the King Lutheran Church. And this is the Book of the Month Bible Study presented by Book, uh, Christ the King Lutheran Church. And I'll be your Bible instructor for the hour. Uh, I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum. It's nice to have, nice to be here uh, with you, with, right, you. Uh, uh, I see one person's live, uh, but most of you guys won't be live. Uh, but we should say before we start, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We have three reasons why we want to say that. Well, one reason is because uh, we're going to be reading the Easter lesson, the resurrection lesson from John chapter 20 today. And the other reason out of three that we should be reading this, or that we should say that, hallelujah, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, hallelujah, is because we are still in the Easter season of the church. Uh, Lent lasts about 40 days, right? Well, the season of Easter lasts 50 days from Easter until Pentecost. And so during this time, I like to take any opportunity I can to go ahead and say that Easter acclamation. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Now, the third reason. That's right, Edith. He is risen indeed. The third reason why we want to say that is because it's true because we believe it, that we have a risen Savior. We rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 would tell us, if Christ is not raised, your faith is futile, it's useless, it's in vain, and you are still in your sins. But indeed, Christ has been raised, that same chapter will tell us. We rejoice not only in the cross, but the empty tomb. In both of them, our salvation and our Savior. From the cross he died, suffering our punishment. And from the tomb we see his victory. We see his conquering death and Satan and sin himself. So we rejoice there. Now, we are uh, going to be in John chapter 20 today. Uh, we're, this is the end of the month. And I've got one more chapter to do, chapter 21. Now, uh, <laughs> if I was a smart man, sorry guys, if I was a smart man, I would have, oh no, 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 I'm not answering the phone right now. If I was a smart man, I would have said, let's just finish it up next week and, uh, and carry into that. But... I didn't say I didn't plan that and so I've already kind of decided and started planning that next week the next month is uh, we're gonna go back to Revelation Revelation chapter 9 but since I've already decided that I don't want to change my plan now and try to you know change midstream and, and change what I've said I should have I should have just said well we'll we'll go into May that first week and do John chapter 21 so what's gonna happen in June We'll do chapter 21, and then we'll move on to what other, whatever other book we're doing in the, in the month of June. I, I haven't uh, thought that far ahead either. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, I want to say one more thing before we get started. Today is April 26th, 2022. Now, for a bunch of people, who cares what the date is, right? And uh, if, you, if this is your birthday, well then, happy birthday. Uh, but I want to celebrate another birthday, an anniversary. Uh, on April 26, 1847, 175 years ago, uh, my church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, was formed, was organized by, I think it was 10, but I could be wrong at this point because now I'm forgetting, 10 Lutheran congregations and um, uh, and it was called uh, it was formed in a church in Chicago uh, but uh, it was in actually the title was in German too like the the Lutherische uh, Evangelische Kirche or something like that I don't know German but the 
uh, Lutheran Church of Missouri, Ohio, and other states. <laughs> you know, uh, it was back, you know, when all, all you had was a railroad, right? And so, and you, you barely had a telegraph. So, uh, you know, how was communication and how was travel? And so a lot of church bodies were geographically bound, right? Well, uh, these uh, churches realized that they shared the same confession of faith and they shared the same heritage. And so it was starting to grow. And so they were became a network, a church body of 10 congregations to start. And it soon grew from there. I think we're at over 6,000 congregations now. Uh, and so this is our 175th anniversary. And I just uh, am, am proud uh, to be a part of our church body. And uh, I don't mean to be arrogant about it. I'm, I'm also very humble. Uh, I hope I'm so humble. <laughs> I'm proudly humble. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to be a pastor in this church body too. So um, anyway, enough about that. If you don't care about the Missouri Synod, uh, maybe you can just go, okay, thank you. Move on. All right, so let's move on. All right, uh, we're going to be in John chapter 20, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Okay, let us pray. Your heavenly Father, we, we give you thanks that you have brought us to this day, that we can study the scriptures of uh, John chapter 20, and hear again the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May we take this to heart, hear it, ponder it, learn from it, and may we be again renewed and changed by hearing it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, and we've got another viewer. So welcome to my two live viewers. Happy to see you. <laughs> Peace. All right. Um, John chapter 20 is where we're going to be, right? Uh and we take a look at this here. Uh, so Jesus has been in, in John chapter 19 uh, crucified, and he died, and he was buried. Okay? All right? So uh, now let's take the big cosmological look at this. And what do we have? We have the Son of God, the, uh, the creator of the universe, is now put in a tomb under the ground. You know, that's that's how far things have come, <laughs> uh, by God's plan even. John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb, both of them running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. All right, so thus the first 10 verses. We have 31 verses to go here, and already we have something to talk about here. Oh, of course we've got something to talk about. On the first day of the week, all right? So remember, Jesus is crucified, uh, let's say Friday, okay? Let's first take that. Jesus is crucified on a Friday, and he laid in the tomb uh, Friday afternoon to Saturday, and now to Sunday, the first day of the week, all right? Now, why did I kind of glitch a little bit when I wanted to say on Friday? Um, it's... Um, I mentioned it last week that depending on you know, which gospel, I think the gospel of John actually makes it seem as if he's crucified on a Thursday. You have to kind of read that there. Um, and, and, uh, according to how you might understand or interpret some of the things it says about the day of preparation and when the Passover was and things like that. So, 
Uh, good question, but I believe the historical precedent, the histor the, the weight of people understanding this has always been that he was crucified on a Friday, right? So there's a small amount of people that will see that discrepancy, or not a discrepancy, difference in interpretation, and they will choose to go with the Thursday reading, okay? And I'm not going to fight them, and I'm not going to misinterpret, or, you know, uh, uh, kind of attack them or anything, but I, I think I'm going to learn from the weight of all of the historians of most of 2,000 years and say, I'm going with what they say, and it's a Friday, okay? So, all right, but so the uh, first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark. The other Gospels will tell us that others came with her, and so we don't really have a, an apparent contradiction here. If one says one person and the other Gospels say two or three people came, well, it was at least one, right? So let's, John is focusing on Mary Magdalene uh, in this story, the author John. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Uh, their intent was to finish the preparation with uh, fragrances and uh, things like that to uh, honor the body for burial. Uh, and so they they had not really completed all that. All right, um, came to the tomb early while it was still dark before sunrise. She wants to do this and get her done. Um, and so they came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. In the other gospels, they, they gotta go, but they're like, we don't even know how we're gonna get the stone rolled away. Who will roll the stone away, right? And, and uh, it, that stone had been sealed. The tomb was had been under guard. So what do we see here? The stone has been rolled away. It's open. <laughs> uh, one time when I was a uh, young teenager, middle school age, um, I had to leave, you know, my parents both worked. And I had to leave the house in the morning and I had to come home to the house in the afternoon and take care of myself, right? And times were different then, right? You could do that and not uh, uh, call family services. But I came home in the afternoon and the door was open to my house. And I came inside very carefully. Who's in my home? Hello? Hello? Maybe my brother's home. No. My brothers weren't home. Hello? Mom and Dad? No, because there were no cars in the driveway. I came home to the door standing open of my house. And I'm, you know, let's say I'm 14 or something. Um, and it's wide open and there's nobody in there. And that's kind of a kind of a creepy feeling uh, because you think the door should have been shut if there's no, you know, and it, you come home to an empty house, you'd think you would close the door. Apparently, when I went to school in the morning, I didn't close the door. And apparently, it stayed open all afternoon, all morning and all afternoon until I got home. And the screen door was there, but nothing else. And apparently, I lived in a good neighborhood where no one bothered my house. <laughs> the house that my parents, that we all lived in. Um, amazing. So Mary comes, and it's still dark. She comes to an empty tomb, and the door is open. The stone has been rolled away. Now, you should, when you come to a tomb, not expect an empty house, but a full house, right? You should come to a tomb and expect there to be at least one dead body inside the tomb. Um, the, the way the tomb, uh, those tombs there were arranged probably could have, you know, had different shelves or whatever uh, with where different bodies would be. Uh, but she comes in and it's empty, right? Uh, so she runs home. Uh, Simon and Peter, uh, she goes home to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where, they, where he is. We don't know where they've laid him. Someone took Jesus' body. Someone took, that's the accusation here, right? So we don't, and we don't know. So Peter uh, went out and ran, um, and the other disciple, and they were both running together. Uh, the other disciple is, we, we have every reason to believe it's the Apostle John. 
okay so you have Peter and John running together um, and this is kind of a you know John was the youngest of them so you got kind of old man middle-aged Peter trying to run and probably doing a, a you know as good as an old man can do it as good as a middle-aged man can do and then you've got young John running probably and it says that the other guy got there first John outran Peter all right I think this is funny because uh, it's John's book. John is the uh, human author of this gospel. And uh, I just happened to find a little bit of humor in it where, uh, you know, you, they have this foot race apparently. No, uh, I'm just, let me find the humor in it first. They have this foot race and they're saying, but it was the young guy who got there first. <laughs> and it's really the author going, but I, I beat him. <laughs> but I got there before Peter. Um, now, that's just the humor in it, but let's see what's really happening here. Someone took their rabbi, their Lord's body. Someone's messing with dead bodies and the body of someone they loved. And so they're going to run and they're going to book it out there to the tomb to find out what's going on, right? If you've ever felt a crisis, a, an emergency, and your body just leaped into action, and sometimes uh, this happens and you find yourself immediately, you know, the adrenaline's pumping and everything, and you're, you're going faster than you thought you would have gone. You've uh, jumped into action. You're immediately alert, immediately on the move, whatever the thing was. Uh, you know that that's kind of probably what happened for them. They weren't like, huh, maybe we should check it out. I get the impression that someone says, Jesus' tomb is open and it's empty. And they run, right? They run to go find out. So the other disciple gets there first, but Peter goes in, right? Um, but they see this, the linen cloths lying there, but uh, Peter goes in and sees the linen cloths and the face cloth, which was not with the linen cloths. The, you know, this is all the burial cloths and whatever, but the face cloth had been folded up in a place by itself. Now, what the common understanding of this is, is that Jesus resurrected, right? And sat up and, you know, the face cloth, whatever the, you know, whatever would have been the normal face cloth for uh, a body. And, and he folds it up and puts it down in, a, in an organized way and pushes away the sheets, right? The, the linens that he's on and gets up and leaves the tomb. However, the way is for that. So this suggestion is there's no evidence of a grave robbery because they would just throw away the, the linens and not care about what to do with anything. Who would bother to fold up the linen if they were a grave robber? The face cloth, right? All right, so that's the, uh, the impression here is that Jesus revived, woke up. I don't mean to make it a, you know, however you want to use to the fact that Jesus came to again, resurrected, and uh, sat up and got rid of the cloths and folded the face cloth. And I would imagine folded the face cloth first. But anyway, you see what I mean? And he walked away. Uh, that there's no evidence, no reason to think that this is what it would look like if it had been ransacked by grave, grave robbers, okay? Now, I want to address something that's out on the internet. Uh, you know how sometimes on the internet, um, Something can seem to be well-meaning, uh, but maybe it's misunderstood. Yeah, it's amazing what you can find on the internet, right? So there's this uh, story that's put out there uh, on the internet, and I do not know if any part of it is true, but I disagree with its conclusion. All right. Now the uh, it it says that in this time the master of a house at dinner we would have his napkin and if he's called away from the dinner table he would put the napkin down and leave the table uh, but in this telling saying you know in a Middle Eastern household or whatever that uh, if he's called away from the table and he intends on coming back to the table he folds the napkin the cloth or whatever and lays it down nicely and leaves and that if he is not intending to come back to come back he just you know plops the napkin down and thus the servants can know oh don't clean the table yet he, the master is coming back 
uh, if it's folded. Or, uh, oh, he just threw it down. He's not coming back. We can clean the table. All right. And then the conclusion is Jesus folded the napkin, the face cloth, uh, up, which means he's coming back. And so don't lose heart because Jesus is coming back because of the folded napkin. Uh, bless their hearts. I disagree with this, with the conclusion. I mean, maybe it's true that a folded napkin means uh, don't clear the table yet. They're, they're not done eating. Uh, but a, a, a tossed napkin that's not folded, that might fall on the food, uh, would mean that they're not coming back. Uh, I disagree with the conclusion that this must mean that Jesus Christ is coming back, risen from the tomb, and he's coming back. All right. Uh, for one, this is not a dinner table. This is a tomb. So I don't know if we can assume the manners of a Middle Eastern, Israeli, Israelite, Palestinian, whatever, dinner table also apply. We can't make the assumption that that also applies for when you're resurrected from the dead and you walk out of your tomb. Okay? So maybe uh, you can't put a lot of stock in this just because it's not a dinner table. It's a tomb. Right? Now, it does not say uh, that Jesus got up from the tomb and left the earth. He got up from the tomb and was found by people for 40 days before he ascended into heaven, right? So it's not as if a folded napkin in the tomb means that Jesus is coming back. Because that would mean, you know, if the master leaves the napkin and leaves the table, well then don't clear the table, he's coming back. You, it, it seems as if then you would conclude, oh wait, he's not done with the tomb. He'll come back to the tomb? So leave the sheets where they are. He's not done being buried. Right? So... I, I think that this, um, let's assume that this internet story called The Folded Napkin uh, is is honest and sincere. I think it doesn't really come to the right conclusion that The Folded Napkin in John chapter 20, verse 7, means he's coming back. I think it just means he got up, folded the napkin, and left right the napkin the fold the facial cloth right uh, so bless the heart of whoever wrote the story of the folded napkin uh, trying to draw a conclusion about the Easter resurrection but I think it's a leap too far you got it okay so hopefully that kind of uh, if someone emails that to you or puts it on Facebook and says, read the story of the folded napkin, you, you, you can lovingly say, Christ is risen. And that's what this email tries to say. But uh, you, then you can try to say, I'm not sure if we want to make the conclusions this email does. We want to, I mean, yes, Christ is risen. And yes, Christ will come again. But I don't think the, the dinner table manners of Palestine or Israel or the Middle East uh, necessarily help us to understand the Bible in John chapter 20. Okay? So bless their hearts. I, I just I wanted to put that out there because that's something we want to read and we want to believe it and we want to say that looks great. But I think upon further study, um, it, it, it might be something that uh, even a fellow Chris, let's assume it wasn't someone trying to scam us, right? You're trying to spread dumb stories. But let, let's assume it was faithfully offered as an understanding. I think it might be a misapplication. Okay? All right. So, bless their hearts. All right. But the, the disciples go in and they see and believe, it says in verse 8, that John, the other disciple, he went in, he saw and believed. Because at this point, they really hadn't understood. I get the impression that maybe they knew the scriptures about the resurrection, 
but they hadn't understood as if that when Jesus dies they were living those two days after the crucifixion of Jesus saying where's his resurrection because he promised it he did promise it and the Old Testament promises the resurrection of the Savior um, but they hadn't been getting to that point in their own faith life to say he's coming back because he said he would come back right as yet they did not understand this from the scripture that he must rise from the dead but see now it's like they get he must he must be alive right it's like oh they see and believe Jesus is not here and Jesus is risen not stolen but risen okay so it seems like they're getting it but it's still hard to probably take in the first time uh, I grew up as a Christian and so maybe some of this to me seems like when have I not known this or understood it at least in some part but can you imagine living it for the first time and trying to say is that really what's happening right now <laughs> the the Lord is is risen from the dead right uh, bless your hearts everyone if you perhaps know someone in your life who, who has died and then you have to come to the realization that maybe they'd be alive you can imagine how hard that would be it happens in the soap operas I guess but uh, hopefully the time of soap operas has passed but anyway you know what I mean it, you if you are convinced someone is dead it's totally unexpected to suddenly say but I think they'll be alive again unless you have come to know and believe the Christian faith and trust in the promises of the resurrection of Christ means the resurrection of all believers right okay all right so we get to the next part here uh, so the disciples have gone home goes back to their homes verse 11 but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet they said to her woman why are you weeping she said to them they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him having said this she turned around and saw Jesus standing but she did not know that it was Jesus Jesus said to her woman why are you weeping and whom are you seeking supposing him to be the gardener she said to him sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away Jesus said to her Mary she turned and said to him in Aramaic Rabboni which means teacher Jesus said to her do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father but go to my brothers and say to them I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her oh, okay I hear this every Easter if I don't read it any time between them the good news of the Easter story and here Mary of course <laughs> what's happening and I'm not trying to say you know anyone's too weepy but this is all confusing and so it's no surprise that someone would be crying over this and Mary's weeping and but she looks into the tomb and sees two angels but it's almost as if she doesn't understand that they're angels right it says which there's two angels in there in white um, it, you don't expect white dazzling white to be inside a tomb and there's two one at the head and one at the feet, foot of where Jesus had been and um, they're like why are you crying right woman why are you weeping now we have to understand something in translation all right uh, in English in American talk today if you say woman why are you weeping it sounds unkind right you know let me act it out a little bit woman <laughs> you know are you trying to be like woman why are you weeping and that sounds unkind to women to, to say woman why are you weeping um, well the, this word it doesn't have to be uh, the rude way of talking in Israel 2,000 years ago right 
And so uh, where it might just simply translate today, uh, woman, uh, it could have been, you know, dear lady. It could have had the, the linguistic weight of being a kindness to say ma'am, right? Or something like that. Um, uh, and, and and so don't, if we're like, woman, why are you weeping? No, 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 no. Don't assume that it sounds bad, okay? All right, we got to remember that there's some translational, you know, and uh, some linguistic usages that maybe we don't get just from kind of hearing the words. So they're not mad. They're not rude. They're not chauvinistic, anything like that, right? So why are you weeping? They, they want to ask this for concern. And uh, she says, my Lord is missing. I don't know where he is. And she turns around and sees Jesus. But she doesn't know who he is. Um, she's not recognizing. And uh, why would she not recognize Jesus? One, she doesn't expect to recognize Jesus. She doesn't expect him to be there. So she's not anticipating recognition. Two, the last time she saw Jesus, he was bloody and dead. Right? And now he is alive and probably clean and, and beautiful again. Right? Um, however beautiful Jesus was. Right? And three, he's in his resurrected body, right? Now we know our resurrected bodies are going to be perfected, right? So his, just speaking in terms of his human body, it looked like a human body before it died. And then it died like a beaten up and bruised and bloody human body. And now there's no more uh, weakness or, or scarring or anything on there except the nail marks, right? Whether it's here or here, right? Um, and, and so uh, his resurrected body may have that perfection of eternity that we will all have, and, and it may not have any of the human weaknesses or imperfections of the human body before resurrection, right? So his resurrected body may have had a slightly different appearance or something like that. So and Jesus says, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now, I think this is good because you're in a tomb and you're not looking for a thing. You're, you're in a tomb looking for the dead. Who do you think you would have found here? Uh, whom are you seeking, right? And it's actually a, a question with a lot of weight to us. Uh, what are we seeking? Who are we hoping to find? Where are we hoping to find Jesus? How do we expect Jesus to be when we supposedly find him, right? You know, when we are, are searching for answers, are we looking for Jesus to have them? When we're searching for comfort or hope or assurance, are we looking to Jesus to say, I have to go to the cross and the empty, empty tomb to find my hope and confidence, all right? Uh, they went to the cross and they, uh, they went to the empty tomb hoping to find death. Now they didn't want it, but they were expecting to find a dead Jesus. But now we know when we go to the empty tomb, we expect either to find a living Jesus or no Jesus because he is not dead. He is risen indeed, right? Okay, so Jesus says, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? You know, are your tears for the person you expected to be dead, but is not here? And who would that be? You know, put it out in words. And so she thinks he's the gardener. Uh, and, and so you, you could make some uh, comment there about the Garden of Eden and Jesus walking in the Garden of Eden. And now here he is again in the garden uh, and Jesus being in the garden as the one tending the garden. But uh, I'm not going to go too far on that. I'm not sure how far to take that. Uh, but she says, sir, if you took him, let me know, and I'll take him into my care. This Jesus guy. You know, I don't know why you took him from the tomb, <laughs> but give him back, right? Um, and Jesus simply says, Mary. He calls her by name. I see this, you know, I, I always envision this with the great kindness. Not like, Mary, <laughs> me? No, I don't think that's it. I think it's calling her to see him. Mary with some sort of immense compassion for his friends and his followers, uh, 
for you know compassion for those who are loving him and caring you know wanting to see that he is well and not just being a mistreated dead body <laughs> um, so he says Mary and uh, she turns and says Rabboni which is like my rabbi or teacher that's what rabbi is is a teacher of the Jewish faith rabbi teacher and uh, I think the I at the end means like my teacher all right and uh, you can just imagine this Rabboni and hug okay because what does Jesus say next uh, do not cling to me all right so I think we have the impression is that she's given him a hug and you, some people have you know drawn the image that she's hugging him at his feet like kneeling or something uh, or just you know <laughs> hugging the master you know in a great big full of compassion love and comfort and thankfulness hug and you can I I'm just imagining that that's the way it is because Jesus says do not cling to me now again you can I think you can add a tone here that you don't want to do not cling to me get away right Ugh, stop touching me no I don't think that's Jesus at all he's I think he's saying okay but you're gonna have to let go because our work isn't done here you have to go and talk to the disciples now right um, so it's not uh, like ooh, stop touching me or like uh, you can't touch me I'll hurt you because of my divine power <laughs> back off keep a distance or or like uh, you know any any sort of weird um, uh, fairy tale thought about this about Jesus power being uh, impressed or hurt or or afflicting her because you know but he says do not yet do not cling to me I, I think it's you know let me go can we say it that way okay Mary let me go now uh, because I have to I'm gonna have to go to my father and you're gonna have to go and tell the disciples okay so what does he say I've not yet ascended to my father so uh, let me just assume there'll be plenty of time to hug Jesus in heaven okay um, that now I'm I'm adding my own way of taking that so don't take that as a from the Bible Bible verse it that it doesn't say in Hessians chapter 2 there'll be plenty of time to hug Jesus in heaven right that's not a real Bible verse but that's that's my assumption and inference that he says uh, I haven't yet ascended into heaven and it sounds like th then there'll be time for other things right just maybe assuming that myself uh, I have not yet ascended to my father but go to my brothers and say to them I will be I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God all right <laughs> I agree Edith um, and uh, so this idea that he's saying now you have to go Mary Mary Magdalene and you have to go bear this news back to them not just the tomb is empty Jesus has been taken but I saw Jesus Jesus is alive and human and whole and he's alive he's not dead right this is the message uh, go to my brothers now this is also very interesting this is the first time Jesus never calls his disciples brothers until after the resurrection I don't want to make too much more of that but just an interesting thing to know about the scriptures that and now you know he's been called them his disciples he's called them his followers he even at one point called them his friends but now he, this uh, compassion uh, is, is building into another uh, intimate lovely family word of saying my brothers right and let's assume that this is the way he sees all believers brothers and sisters in Christ brothers and sisters of Christ right uh, so go and tell them uh, and say to them that I will be as, uh, ascending to my father to my father and your father to the Heavenly Father right he's my father because I'm the Son of God he's your Heavenly Father because you are his people the people of Yahweh right and and so Mary Magdalene goes and announces to the disciples I have seen the Lord and then he and then she tells everybody the things and that he has said these things to her right okay all right so let me check the time here oh we're doing good for time the next bit 
Now, if you were in a, a church this Sunday, this might have been your reading for this Sunday, the story of Thomas. Okay, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna redeem Thomas's reputation here. Okay, all right. Uh, so John chapter twenty, verse nineteen and following. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for, the, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus again said, or said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Okay, so that last part is kind of a catcher on what we have to talk about here. But so... At that same day, on the evening of that day, so carrying on from 18 to 19, it's the same day. It's the day of the resurrection, what we call in uh, Western culture in the English language, Easter, right? Now, sorry, could you say that again? Apparently Siri thought I wanted to say something, but no. All right, so... Um, uh, let, let's take a minute and say Easter. Is that a pagan word? I'm just not going to worry too much about that, okay? Maybe in English this word Easter comes from the Celtic or Gaelic or, or a Germanic word that maybe had in, in the Celtic times, you know, some connection to, um, uh, you know, uh, oyster. Oyster or something like that, the, the goddess of spring or some sort of Celtic thing, okay? So, and, and in the, the um, you know, Latin, Hebrew, uh, uh, Greek, uh, French, and Spanish, it, you know, it, it's called Pascha or, or something like that. And, and I think in Spanish it's called Pascuas. I talked to Pastor Miguel about this. Uh, I just might not have pronounced it right. It's, it's called Pascha, Pascha, uh, meaning the passion. So this is a whole passion story, and Easter is the fulfillment of it, right? So when we hear about the passion of Christ, that's linguistically connected to these other religions, or other, same religion, other languages calling the whole Easter thing Pascha, all right? Um, now, so where did English, we get this Easter thing? Well, probably we got the word from the Celtic thing about the uh, some sort of pagan thing. But it doesn't mean that celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ is really a pagan thing. right? This is where those who want to twist Christianity in the English language and misapply or accuse us of doing something that we don't even know that we're doing. Like, you're really worshiping a pagan god. No, we're not worshiping a pagan god. A word that had been used in the Celtic language, for instance, has now been assumed into Christian usage also, and we use it to designate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, uh, you, you got to tell these people that are like, that's a pagan thing. Well, maybe it once had that connection, but uh, let's admit it. Now, so in the English language, ever since Christianity has been in the English language, this has come through for us, and, and, and this word now means for us a Christian meaning. It's not like we're blending paganism. Maybe we took a word and took it into the English language, into our Christian uh, meaning, right? But it's, I, if they want to accuse us of paganism, they're just kind of, oversimplifying this to an embarrassing point to an embarrassing degree is not what they say you know and so maybe the origin of the word and i'm saying maybe because i'm not an expert on this because i really don't care <laughs> what is easter to me it means alleluia christ is risen he is risen indeed alleluia what were the origins of the word i could look that up and it'll be trivia for me it won't care or matter to me now if we all started saying we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord instead of the word Easter, that's fine. 
but we're not, and so we use the word Easter. And when we use the word Easter, we don't mean plastic grass, plastic eggs, and a bunny suit. We mean Christ is risen, right? And so, verse 19. On that evening of that first day, they are locked in the upper room. What does it say? The disciples are locked in that room for fear of the Jews. Now you can understand this. First, they're afraid of the Jews who might want to crucify them too. And now, if they've heard this news about Jesus being raised from the dead and they haven't, they don't know what to do with it, they might be locked away for fear of the Jews because they're going to say, where did you, you, rob, you robbed his tomb. Where did you take his body? <laughs> so they're locked in. And I like to think that they are locked in with their fear. And Jesus comes and stands among them. He intrudes upon their fears with his word, peace. Right? I'm walking right into your fears and I'm bringing you the peace of Christ. I'm going to stand with you. You're afraid, but what do I bring you? Peace. Peace be with you. <gasps> and so he shows them his hands, his feet with nail marks, right? He showed them his hands. Oh, and his side with the sword mark, right? And they get it. He is raised. You know, he's got the wounds. This is the same Jesus who died. Uh, but, you know, was it in his hand or in his wrist? Um, uh Realistically, it was probably here, and I'm not trying to, I think it, it doesn't compromise the words of Scripture to say it was here and not here, okay? His hands, it, also in the language, you could understand his hand to mean hand and wrist or something like that, right? Because uh, it seems as if you, you put a nail here and expect a body to hang by that, it's going to rip through all those finger bones. But you get it in between the two wrist bones and maybe it'll stick, right? I'm not an expert on this. But, so if you want to, right? Okay. Um, but they're glad because they see the Lord. And so Jesus again says, so let me tell you again, peace be with you. And now, I, even as God has sent me into the world, I'm sending you out into that world. You're not going to be able to stay in this room afraid, locked away for fear, Right? As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And what does he do? Uh, excuse me. Uh, what does he do? He breathes on them. I can't act this out. I've tried to, at times to envision how things happen, but I just cannot guess in a likely way how do you breathe on them? Do you, Is it standing back within 10 feet? You know, or are you getting up in each person's faith going, <sighs> right? Uh, we can make this silly, and it doesn't help us understand it, right? Especially in our COVID world. Jesus, don't breathe on everything, right? Um, but he breathes on them, and what does he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. I am giving you the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important to know for a few reasons. One, the Holy Spirit, the the rhema, uh, hagios, <laughs> The Rhema Hagios, the Spirit, the Holy One, uh, Rhema is also the same word for breath. So, when he gives the Spirit, he breathes on them. <sighs> and, and it brings to them the Holy Spirit, he says. And so, now, however you want to act it out, I, I don't think that helps me to try to envision it, because I tried. But just stick with his words. He breathes on them and he says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit from this. I'm bestowing the, the Holy Spirit, which also is the same word as breath, uh, you know, the breath of spiritual life upon you. And uh, if you forgive the sins of any, oh, see, now what's happening? With the Holy Spirit in them, with faith, with God, uh, giving them this uh, commission, uh, this this uh, assignment. What are they supposed to do? I'm sending you out into the world. And what are you going to do out in the world? You're going to go with the Holy Spirit and you're going to forgive sins. I love it. I just love it. You know, we love the Great Commission, go and make disciples. But this is awesome here. You know, what is a church going to do? What is a Christian going to do? Well, from the mouth of the risen Savior, on the day he rose, he said, 
go and forgive sins. That's what I want you to do. I want you to be the forgiveness people. I want you to be forgivenitarians. I want you to go around and uh, I want the message to be about you. All you do is preach forgiveness. And Christians will say, that's right. We preach the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ who died and rose again, suffered for our sins, assure us of their, of their forgiveness, of our forgiveness, and gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And so, if, if what's our job as Christians? Forgive sins, right? What's the job of the apostles now? Forgive sins. What's the job of pastors? Forgive sins. Preach the forgiveness of sins. Does it sound like this? Jesus forgives you. Yes, it does. Does it sound like this? As a fellow Christian, I declare to you the good news that Jesus Christ forgives you. Yes. Does it sound like this? I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. Yes. I forgive you all your sins, right? Now, this is where uh, a lot of times, and fellow Christians, they go, who does that pastor think he is to forgive sins, right? Is he assuming too much? Is he getting a little bit of a power trip, assuming he can go around forgiving sins? And, uh, and, and those pastors say, Oh, I'm just doing what God told me to, right? Um, I'm just doing what he told me to. Forgive sins. If you forgive the sins, right? So it's not even to say Jesus forgives sins. He says, you go and forgive sins. So if someone says, I forgive you in Jesus' name, right? It, that sounds like you forgive them, Jesus says. You can do it. So it's not as if, as if we even have to say, God tells me he forgives sins. I don't. No, he said, you go and forgive sins. So uh, what are pastors? Forgivers. What are apostles? Forgivers. What are Christians? Forgivers, right? If we have a hard time forgiving, it means we have a hard time understanding Jesus' forgiveness. If we think forgiveness is for me, but not for anyone else, then it kind of means I think I deserve my forgiveness and I'm self-righteous. Like, well, of course I'm forgiven, but not you. <laughs> no, that's awful, right? Um, and, and, and so he says, forgive sins, because guess what I've done for you? I've forgiven all your sins. So you take the forgiveness and go and give it out. Spread it around. Let there be forgiveness from one land to the next. Let all people know that Jesus is the forgiver of sins. Right? And then this hard news, if you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now, as a deputized agent of Christ, uh, why do we withhold forgiveness? Not because I'm bitter and not because I'm jealous and because they ate my porridge when I didn't want them to. I wanted my porridge for me. No, we forgive sins because, or we withhold forgiveness of sins because we see that there's no repentance. There's no acknowledgement uh, that this is a sin that needs to be forgiven. Or maybe it's just a down, hard-hearted, cold-stoned person who says, I don't want forgiveness from Jesus. I don't need forgiveness from Jesus. So Jesus wants everybody to be forgiven, but there are some who are going to reject the idea of sin. There are some who are going to say, it ain't me who needs forgiveness. It's that other Joe, right? There are some who are going to say, I'm going to keep doing this. It's not a sin, so I'm going to keep doing it, right? And there are some who are going to say, I don't want your Jesus. So I don't want the forgiveness he supposedly brings. Get, get your Jesus forgiveness away from me. That's awful, right? So there's times where we have to say, Forgiveness is withheld from you until there's knowledge and, and repentance, right? Um, it's a deep and hard subject, and it takes a lot of time and practice. We don't just go around hoping that we can withhold forgiveness. We hope that we can pronounce forgiveness, all right? We've got to get on here uh, through these verses. Uh, verse 24, uh, poor Thomas, right? Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, 
uh, by the Jewish way of counting, this is the next Sunday. Okay, all right. So eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right, now uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I want to redeem Thomas's reputation and, and make sure that we don't even scold Thomas. And I don't think we have to see even Jesus scolding Thomas, all right? Because working on this for the last few weeks, especially through Easter, kind of come to see some other people kind of reflecting on this too. All right. So Thomas is one of the 12 and he misses Easter, right? He missed that day with them when Jesus appeared resurrected. He didn't get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So one week later, and that's how you kind of in, in uh, the Jewish way of counting, you count the day and then the other days. So we would say seven days and the Jewish way of counting would be eight, okay? So eight days later, uh, one week later, Thomas is with them. He's with them now, and they've had an Easter celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he hasn't. Um, so eight days later, they're, uh, oh, let me back up. He says, I can't do this. I can't believe in a Jesus. I have no reason. I, I don't see from the scriptures that he had to be risen. You know, maybe he didn't see that. Uh, I I don't see this you know let me see some corroboration all right and, and let, let's kind of you know for those of us who want to see a written word about this and not just a myth um, let, let's give Thomas some break just because he like, we're you know are you guys joking it, what do you mean Jesus is alive show it to me well how could we even expect a risen Jesus when Everything said he was dead, right? So let's let's be easy on Thomas here. He he says, I need to see, I need to know. You guys need to show me something, or I won't believe. Right? And so eight days later, Jesus shows up again in that locked room, and even though the doors are locked, Jesus is here, right? And he Jesus brings peace again. Let there be peace here in my presence, right? And so he says, Thomas, come here. And you almost wonder, did Jesus say, give me your hand and put it in here, right? Give me your fingers. You know, let's put your fingers inside my, my sword wound that is still here. His resurrected body still has the holes for the nails in the sword. We understand this to mean that his victorious resurrection body bears the, the um, symbols of his victory. Not just like, oh, my body didn't heal far enough. No, that he still holds those as proclamations of his victory, of his resurrection. All right, so uh, come here, come here. Hands, touch my hands. You know, put your fingers in my side. I don't want you to be a disbelieving. I want you to be a believing, all right? So we have for 2,000 years, apparently, tried to call him Doubting Thomas. But what happens that's not the way he ended. He ended with being believing Thomas. He got to see. He got to touch. He gets to fall at Jesus' feet and say, My Lord and my God. Right? So Thomas is okay. Right? We, we, we don't admit poor Thomas. I say poor Thomas because he got a bad rap from us. Okay? So let's just give poor Doubting Thomas a name better than Doubting. Let's give him Believer Thomas. Okay? Uh, and then Jesus says, have you believed because you have seen me? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Right? So now Jesus wants to offer a further blessing. Not just to say, you silly guy, uh, you shouldn't have uh, waited to see me. I, I see this as you believe because you saw me. But I want to assure everybody that there's a blessing for those who don't see me. Right? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. That's us. Because we don't get to see Jesus. We don't get to stick our fingers in his side. Uh, maybe in heaven, but not now. We have to go upon the, the testimony of the written word. Right? We have to take the eyewitness testimony and trust it. That's it.
that's my time all right but we they we're done almost here so uh i don't see that thomas should be raked over the coals as much as we want to rake him over the coals he's believing thomas he got to see and believe and rejoice and and jesus then pronounces the blessing to all of us that we will be blessed to believe in the resurrection even though we haven't seen it because we trust by faith in god's word all right so jesus did many other signs in this in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and that by believing you may have life in his name all right i, I love this verse i just really do um two verses you know jesus did many other things oh, uh, in itself that's awesome there's more things they're not even recorded oh well, why can't they be recorded uh, there's many things that Jesus did that's that's good news and and then uh, Jesus did many other things that aren't recorded but why do you have this book of John why do you have this book of Bible these things are written so that you may believe right uh, there's other things but these things I want you to believe says the author John that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God the, the Christ the Savior the Son of God God himself and when you believe in Jesus, you may have eternal life. You may have life in his name. <laughs> Why do we read the scriptures? Well, we may come up, come to it with a different reasons. But God wants us to have life by believing in Jesus Christ. And so we have that faith in Christ. When we read the word, when we hear the proclamation of Jesus, these things are written so that you can have faith, so that you can believe. And when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have salvation all right that is a good awesome place to stop and we'll get verse 20 or chapter 21 in June sometime the first week of June okay let's close with a word of prayer again from the Lutheran study Bible like I like to do uh, dear Lord even though I do not now see you Lord I believe and rejoice with inexpressible joy amen okay say hallelujah Christ is risen he is risen indeed hallelujah have a good week, and I'll be here again next week.